<laughs> integrated pest management. So this is a um, continuation of what we talked about two weeks ago. Uh, integrated pest management is the idea of reducing pesticides while attaining an acceptable level of pest control. Now, one of the things that I want to emphasize when I use the word pesticide, I'm including conventional and organic pesticides in the same context. Because in my mind, a pesticide is a pesticide. There's still poisons. And no, it does not inc include biocontrol, but biocontrol includes the idea of pest management. So this is uh, kind of a picture, and this is a picture from Dick Lindquist, uh, retired from Ohio State University, and he always started every one of his presentations with this, this shot um, of how to apply DDT. And we talked about um, economic thresholds two weeks ago where the economic threshold is going to be different from er for every crop. And for like poinsettias, if you all go out and buy your poinsettias this week, you'll see that they're very cheap or very expensive depending on the, the project. But the, the store. Um, but the white fly threshold for poinsettias is, is, is virtually none, whereas on a greenhouse tomato crop, you can tolerate quite a few more. So the economic threshold depends on the crop and depends on what the pest is that you're looking at. Now I have um, these steps of integrated pest management as pest control and presenting them in this order on, on, on purpose because this is the order I'd like you to think about them, including weed control, sanitation, inspection, exclusion, scouting, environmental conditions, and the last point is eradication. And integrated pest management is this big complex circle and every grower does integrated pest management when they do out and scout a greenhouse thinking about what they're going to treat a pest outbreak with or evaluating the crop. They're thinking about it all this time where they're thinking everything from um, the appropriate cultural practices, use of cu resistant cultivars, um, identify the pest, make sure you know what the pest is, evaluate, uh, that picture I showed you before of them applying DDT in that orchard, they're just killing everything. They're not identifying the pest. They're just saying, okay, we're going to spray and we're going to take them out. Um, evaluate your efficacy, crop, crop health. Appropriate actions could be biological control, cultural control, chemical control, and scouting. So they all come together in a management plan. Sanitation is probably one of the cleanest practices the best control method, method that anybody can use in a greenhouse. Sanitation includes a practice of prevention. We all wash our hands, I hope. Um, but uh, you think about media pasteurization, cleaning the benches, uh, putting disinfectants down with traffic mats, cleaning your tools, uh, monitoring where your employees are going in and out of your greenhouse. Inspection um, includes uh, monitoring incoming plant material. In addition to the sanitation concept, we also want to think about weed control. One of the best things you can do to keep pests down in your greenhouse is to keep the weeds out from under the benches and keep the weeds clean outside the property. One of the best control methods I've ever known is a mower outside. Uh, mowing the weeds, keeping the weeds down, because all the weeds on the ditch bank and under the trees outside the greenhouse are nothing but a harbor for pests and diseases, pest problems. Uh, I can think of times when um, greenhouses located near hay fields, when they go out and bale the hay, especially if it's alfalfa, the alfalfa will be full of thrips. Thrips really don't bother the alfalfa, but when their flowers are gone and have been ba baled up, they look for someplace else to go and they go straight to the greenhouse. So it's good to have a good weed management program um, as part of your sanitation. Inspection refers to monitoring everything that comes into your greenhouse. Uh, scouting, watching, quarantining new plants, getting rid of pet plants. One of the things that I have a problem with is keeping plants around the greenhouse that are full of insects and diseases that nobody wants to get rid of because they're your favorite plant. I get a lot of calls in the fall 
from homeowners that said, can I bring my plants into your greenhouse over the winter? <laughs> I said, no, you cannot. Um, you, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, we don't provide that service. And uh, a lot of greenhouses get actually say, well, you can just put them in the corner. It's not going to be a problem. Well, they're probably going to bring in uh, pests and diseases. Uh, so the pet plants is something that we strive to get rid of. Exclusion, exclusion means keeping them out. And exclusion usually refers to insect screening. Now, the screening is going to be sized according to the pest you're trying to exclude. If you're just looking at keeping out um, Japanese beetle, because the state of Colorado is in Japanese beetle quarantine, that's a pretty big screen to keep that Japanese beetle out compared to Western flower thrips, which is a fine mesh. So when you look at your screen surface, you also have to think about restricted airflow and also uh, double doors. And typically, if they're screening, you want to use double doors that have positive air pressure so that when you open one door, one door the, you're not sucking everything into the greenhouse. Uh, positive pressure cooling is another thing. If the insectary we have here at CSU, where they're doing Russian weed aphid research, they have positive pressure cooling. In other words, they use swamp coolers that push air into the greenhouse to kind of help exclude uh, other insects. So here's a picture of a, of a screen that's being put on the end of a Quonset frame. And the cooling pad is going to be on this uh, right-hand side of the screening. and um, that provides adequate uh, protection from uh, insects like western flower thrips. Now, you would do this in a greenhouse where you're looking at trying to keep viruses out, especially if it's propagation stock, stock plant material. The virus, uh, impatience necrotic spot virus and tomato spotted wilt virus are carried by and vectored by the western flower thrips. And that's why we spend so much effort controlling that. Scouting. Scouting um, is uh, part of the integrated pest management schedule uh, to, to tell you what the pest is, how large the outbreak is. You cannot have a biological control program without scouting. It mm -hmm. requires it because the scout needs to know what the insects are there to identify the appropriate biological control because most of them are species specific. Part of scouting is learning how to use sticky cards. Um, this strip on the bottom is not a scouting monitoring card, but more of a trap. The idea is a trap to keep materials from moving around. We talked about scouting practices. Um, look for off colors, unusual growth, monitor your sticky cards, and do the same pattern on a regular basis in your greenhouse. What the scout will do by identifying the pest the scout also has to be able to access the pesticide application records. And they're identifying chemical families to identify the appropriate rotation of the chemical families to manage a uh, good application procedure and efficacy. Also to identify the application zones, how often, uh, looking at, they also need to know, understand the life cycles of the different insects. They need to be able to identify eggs and to determine which treatments are most appropriate. Environmental conditions. And what we're going to talk about here in a few minutes is a little bit on a temperature and how temperature relates to insect outbreaks. You want to optimize temperatures for plant growth. You don't want to optimize temperature for human workers. You don't want to optimize temperature for insect and disease outbreaks. For instance, spider mites prefer hot, dry conditions. And you might see an outbreak where the pads aren't getting wet. For instance, I've walked into greenhouses, and I've, their greenhouse managers have said, I have a mystery. I have a strip of plants that are infected, infested with spider mites. I can walk in there, and I can say, you have a plugged orifice on your cooling pad. It's calling a dry s strip across your greenhouse. And that's where you're having your mite outbreak. So they prefer hot, dry conditions. So you can manage those by man keeping uh, the climate more uniform. And it leads us finally to eradication. Now note that eradication is the last step. 
Now eradication doesn't automatically mean applying a pesticide. When I get a phone call, somebody says I have a white fly outbreak, white fly outbreak, the first thing they want to know is what can I spray? Well, what I'll tell them is what they can spray, but then I'll go ahead and backtrack and say, okay, what got us here? Why do you have an outbreak in the first place? And I usually start with weed control, sanitation, go through the whole list with them, and then, because this should be your last step, last step of re your last resort, not your first knee-jerk reaction. Now, the best kind of eradication is just take the infected plant material out. It's probably cheaper to destroy a couple of plants that might be infested with aphids than spray the whole bloody greenhouse. Or you might put eradication of infested plant material into a light spray application. Eradication can include biological control. You might want to say, okay, I've got a white fly outbreak. I'm going to release Encarcia formosa wasp, which is going to go through, they're going to go through and, and chomp down and eat the white flies. Finally, you might use a pesticide. This is the last step. This should be your last choice. And the pesticide you choose should be based upon what the needs are. Now, go through a little bit about pesticides. All chemicals used to control plants, whether they're conventional, or organic, or pesticide. And the first thing that you need to do is read the label. And this is required by law, that you read the label. And you should also think about focusing on resistance management. The modern pesticides that we're using are softer on the environment, and which means that they're more typically going to be pesticides that are species specific. In other words, they kill one set of organisms, not a whole bunch. When we use DDT and, and uh, organophosphates, stuff like that, we killed everything. You know, we used to put things like dildrin in the cooling pad, so everything that got sucked through the cooling pad was killed. We didn't have insect problems. We had growers that twitched. But, uh, <laughs> so resistance management, what you're doing is you're going to use two to three applications of a pesticide family, and you're going to rotate it and rotate to a different class. And somebody says, well, why don't I just blend them all together? Well, then there's that one gene pool of pests out there that is resistant to everything, and now they become the dominant. Darwin wins, okay? So it's important also to keep good records, and it's also the law to keep good records. In other words, where we see, when I see um, EPA or the Department of Ag coming into a greenhouse and giving fines, it's usually on record keeping. So here's some insect classes. And we have the class or the family of, organ of uh, pesticides, we have common names, and then we have trade names, okay? And I'm sure in, in plant uh, disease and in entomology, you guys talk a little bit about pesticides, right? Okay. So this is just a group of, of several. Um, benzyl urea um, is a class. That we, another class of biologicals includes things like azadirectin, uh, Bovaria bassiana, Bacillus thuringiensis. Azadirectin is actually a refined form of neem oil. Okay, neem oil is organic. Azadirectin is not because it's been re refined and enhanced. Bovaria bassiana. Bovaria bassiana is actually a fungus. And it's a fungus that actually infects and kills white flies. So you spray it on them. So in other words, if you spray this on there and a day later go there and say, well, I don't think any dead insects. Well, no, you've got to give it a chance to work. So it's a management tool, okay? Uh, one is organic, one is conventional because it's got an oil base. Bacillus thuringiensis, Bt. Bacillus thuringiensis has been used for decades. Dipel, uh, natrol. Bacillus thuringiensis is actually an, a bacterial disease of caterpillars. And what it is, it infects the caterpillar and they, it eats them inside out. The protein from Bacillus thuringiensis is the protein that's been incorporated into cotton, corn, and um, soybeans and other products to make them worm resistant. Okay? So this was some of the first 
genetic engineering. So they were actually looking to put in this protein into plants to eliminate the need for pesticides. So that's what Monsanto's goal was, not to rip everybody off. Another group of biologicals, cinema, cinema aldehyde, cinnamite, it's cinnamon extract. Smells pretty good. Spinosad uh, is a, uh, another biological, it, the, it's a fermentation byproduct. And that now has entered into the organic market, organic over the counter, so much that it's been misused and overused to the point where Western flower thrips are now becoming resistant to it. And in fact, there's three counties in Florida where they have strawberry production. It's illegal to use spinosad because they can't control the flower thrips because it was widely used. I saw this at Perk one year uh, where um, Hort Club started using spinosad that they bought at uh, Gully's over the counter and they started spraying it on everything. Within two months, we had a Western flower thrips outbreak just prior to the trial ground plants coming in that I could not manage. So um, I think some of you have heard that for the next year we're spinosad free at Perk because I'm trying to, because we have another outbreak. And actually this year in Larimer County, we had more, we saw more impatient necrotic spot virus in our garden tomatoes than we've seen ever seen before. And I'm, I don't have any data, I just assume, because too many people are using this product because it's organic. Pyrethrins, pyrethrins are a family. Uh, the biological pyrethrin is an extract from the pyrethrin flower um, and it's commonly used in the organic tomato trade. Um, Biorationals, um, that's a family, kinoprene is one, instar. They are actually insect growth regulators. In other words, they disrupt the uh, ability of an insect go to its next life cycle stage. Uh, carbamates, these are some of the old pesticides, bendiocarb, carbaryl, which is seven. Um, I guess you can still, the homeowners can still buy seven. Um, Pretty, pretty na nasty stuff. Um, methiocarb is what's used for slug and snail bait. Very, pretty toxic, especially to dogs. Um, carboxamide, carboxyl, chloronictinil. Uh, these are the, what we call, this is a, probably we have more development of pesticides coming from this, the chloronictinil family than anything else. These are what we call the neonictinoids. And yes, it sounds like nicotine because they're um, similar chemical structure to nicotine. Nicotine sulfate is an incredible insecticide, so much to the point where I can't imagine anybody, would, never mind. We still have some dirt. Hmm? So we still have some nicotine Yeah, I know, I'm hiding it. I know, exactly. I know, Nick, I wanted to use it, but. Yeah, right, so legal. Huh? You can't use that, can you? Absolutely. You can still use nicotine? Here's the deal. Can you use a pesticide, yes? can use a pesticide that's no longer in the market. It's better to use the pesticide appropriately by label use than it is to dispose of it. Use it in sulfur burner, don't you? It burns on, it's got its own uh, burn, it's just got its own smoke generator. No, don't put it in the sulfur burner. It'll catch on fire. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is a, the imatocloprid is a product, it's called, it's a product called Marathon. Um, the, what's really great about the neonicotinoids is they're, they you can apply to the soil and they'll translocate throughout the plant. And the mammalian toxicity on the neonicotinoids is extremely low, almost negligible. Um, another group of families, uh, dihydrazine, glycosides, abamec, these again, these are, um, a lot of the, the modern pesticides are actually insect growth regulators and they disrupt the life cycle stage then we have the oils, uh, um, clarified hydrophobic oils, neem oils, paraffin oils. Um, what they do is uh, they, su they smother the insect. Um, organochlorines, these are moving off the market. Um, 
organophosphates are pretty much off the market except for acephate. Um, diazinon is still used in the homeowner market some. Are they moving away from uh, uh, petroleum oils? Are they moving away from petroleum oils? No. I mean, the phototoxicity on those is ridiculous, but... The phytotoxicity on some of the petroleum oils is really high. Uh, stylet oil or fine paraffin oils, stuff like this, are really good. But um, as far as dormant oil sprays, they need to be applied with care. Yep. Um, Akari is a miticide. Um, the pyrethroids are synthetic pyrethrums. Pyrethroids are, uh, work very, very similarly to the pyrethrin. These are conventional pesticides, um, but there's a lot of research on the pyrethroids um, uh, in the work. It's coming out. Very effective control organisms. And more families. Insecticidal soaps. Insecticidal soaps are very popular. In fact, I use dish soap all the time. That's what I primarily use to clean up my own insect problems at home. Uh, but insecticidal soap sprays in the greenhouse, you know, there's still a 12 hour restricted entry interval on an insecticidal soap. Why is that? Is that because it's toxic? It is. It's a mucosal irritant. It causes eye and nose damage. So just because it's, you know, you're thinking, oh, safer soap. It's safe. Well, it's still a mucosal irritant because one of the ra ways that it kills the insects is by dissolving and erod eroding the exoskeleton. It can still have some potential um, risk to the uh, applicator. Uh, ovation, this is one of the few products, and that's an ovicide. In other words, it kills insect eggs. So um, these are all different kinds of tools that you can use in the greenhouse. After about five or 10 years in the industry, you'll know all those by heart. You know, do I expect you to learn those for a test? Absolutely not. What I do want you to remember, though, is to understand there are different families of pesticides out there and we want to rotate those families so that we can prevent resistance management because they act and kill insects at different parts of their metabolism. That way it's less likely for them to become resistant. Now, insects and mites, they're cold-blooded animals and their feeding response, reproductive response, development time, survival is all based on temperature. They're slower when it's cold and faster when it's warm. So here's one of our nemesis. This is a two-spotted mite. And at a temperature of 50 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit, it takes about 28.2 days on average for it to go from egg to adult. Raise that temperature to 77 to 95, 8.3 days. So you can manage these somewhat by temperature. So what happens, so one female at 60 can produce 20, at 70 that one female can produce 12,000, at 80 that one female can produce 13 million progeny. So hot, dry conditions, you're setting yourself up for a mite problem. And there they are again. <laughs> So one of the things we use to manage the scouts use is a concept called day degrees. And this is a tool that you can use that the scouts will use to manage their um, pest development. Now just like we talked about um, with, um, other, with plants, they have an upper temperature limit and it varies with species. And the day degrees measures the difference between them. And this is a lot simpler than we use with plants. The entomologists use day degrees and to the difference between the minimum development temperature and average day temperature. So this helps you track your generation times. And the tomato growers use this a lot, especially if you're having, managing a biological uh, release, because they can use this to schedule the best times to do a biological release. Take the maximum temperature plus the minimum temperature add them together and to divide by two and it gives us the average and this average temp you minus the 
development threshold equals day degrees. So if it's less than the pest development threshold, it's zero. Uh, what's the development I'll show you what the development threshold in a minute. In a minute, that's that's a good question. What's the development threshold? Just hang on a minute. So 78, and the development threshold is 54. Or I mean, 78 is the maximum. 54 is the minimum. 66 is our average. If the pest development threshold is 50, that means no growth, no reproduction. So we take 50, subtract that from 66, and it gives us 16 day degrees. And that is the total day degrees to go from egg to adult. That way we can estimate how many generation times we have by adding these together over time. So most low temperature threshold is between 39 and 55, depending on the species. And when um, you, you can get the most rapid outbreaks when you're above most pests around 196 to 1200 day degrees for fast generation. So the low threshold, for instance, on aphids, 42 to 39, I mean, it's a, anything lower, th anything they're going to grow, anything higher than that. Um, Western flower thrips is 50, leaf miners is 50, silver leaf white fly, um, or the greenhouse white fly, you can see they're very different. Um, and this is how many day degrees it has, how many days at 75 degrees for you to get a generation. So for instance, at 75 degrees, it's melon aphids is six, leaf miners is 25. Um, can kind of get an idea of how this works. Okay, so quick review of um, some of our common greenhouse insects and mites. And I'm gonna go through these each individually just to kind of give you a picture. One of the things you need to know is that these aren't the only insects that we have to deal with in the greenhouse. There are lots of other insects we could have. These are the primary ones. Aphids, fungus gnats, shore flies, bulb mites, mites, white flies, thrips. And I threw slugs and snails in here, understanding th that they're mollusks. So aphid. In, um, aphids do very well in cooler greenhouses, seven to 10 days in a cool greenhouse condition. Um, they are apomictic uh, in that they uh, generate without, um, do progressive generations without a, a sexual activity. Um, we typically find them as phloem feeders. Here they are on an Easter lily um, or lily uh, bulb coming out. And you can see the aphids are colonizing the new softer growth. The best families of chemicals to work with them are um, the insect growth regulators and the neonicotinoids and some of the organophosphates in the old days, oils and soaps. Biological control, Boveri bassiana works very well and there's lots of predators than parasitoids that will consume uh, aphids. Everything from um, lace wings to ladybugs. The only problem with ladybugs is that when a ladybug runs out of something to eat, they leave. Put Sprite in the pan. Hmm? Put Sprite in the pan. Put Sprite in the pan. Well, that's in your, in your home greenhouse. Okay. Um, fungus gnats. Now note the fungus gnats got, uh, he's got the little rounded wings. And the fungus gnat adult is actually not much more of, of a problem than a nuisance in that we just don't like to see them flying around. The larvae, however, they're a problem, and they go from a de egg to adult in 21 to 28 days. The larvae, the little clear to white uh, larvae, they're about um, just under, right at an eighth of an inch long. They got a little black uh, nose on them. Um, this is what poinsettias rooted cuttings look like that have been consumed or been in a heavy larvae infestation from uh, fungus gnats. And the ones on the, uh, on the left are healthier, and the ones on the right have been chomped on pretty heavy. 
fungus net management. To me, when people have fungus net problems, it tells me they're watering too much, too much water. Uh, that's the first thing I think of. Uh, the best way to prevent fungus net outbreaks is sanitation and proper cultural practices. The best chemicals to use, of course, are insect growth regulators. Um, these are um, products that prevent it from going to the larvae to the adult. And of course, we have lots of biological control organisms, specifically nematodes. Also, Bacillus thuringiensis works very, very well on um, fungus gnats. Um, I remember one time I was working with a grower that had a fungus gnat outbreak so bad that he was finding lesions on his poinsettia leaves, poinsettia stems that had fungus gnat larvae growing in them. The lesions were rotting and he decided to use uh, orthene, which uh, is um, organophosphate. It's got some systemic activity and he put it on so much that he defoliated his whole crop three weeks before Christmas shipping. Anyway, the shore fly is different than the fungus gnat. They're, ling they're, they're a little bigger insect and their leaves are straight back. Uh, shore flies, again, are algae feeders. The best way to control is, is to keep your algae down in your greenhouse. There's another um, fly that we find in a greenhouse called a drain fly or a sewer fly. And it looks like a fungus gnat wings except the eyes are fuzzy. And we see those when we have just too much algae. And I see drain flies in greenhouses where they're using too much fertilizer. And they got algae growing in cracks and crevices on the floor. Uh, shore flies, they are really, really, really nothing more than a nuisance. They look nasty, they look bad, they leave spots everywhere. Um, the best thing to do, you know, you can use these pesticides, but the best thing to do is just not water too much. Western flower thrips is probably one of our biggest nemesis. Um, you've got little bitty, they're not a strong flyer. They fly, they move with air, with air currents. In fact, they have found western flower thrips in the jet stream. I mean, they're everywhere. And um, the western flower thrips, they're a rasping feeder and a pollen feeder. We typically find them in flowers. And they, their mandibles are such that they scrape the surface of the tissue. And as the flower develops, you see the scratch marks on the tissue. The biggest issue with the western flower thrips is they're required, to, um, they transmit the um, um, impatiens necrotic spot virus and western um, tomato spotted wilt virus. So egg to adult, 12 to 45 days. Um, they're easy to spot with a hand lens because uh, all stages have the little red eyes. The best products, uh, conserve used to be the best product, um, but it's being harder and harder to use. Biologicals, uh, some people will use sugar in their spray to bait the uh, amount because they hide in the cracks and crevices of the flowers and stuff and they're hard to get out, hard to get the pesticide to the thrips. So if we put a little sugar in the water, they'll come out to the pesticide and that helps with some of these products. Slugs and snails, um, there is no animal on the face of this earth that has more teeth in their mouth than a slug. It's nothing but an eating machine. And a lot of times, um, slugs and snails, people don't see, they see the damage, but they don't see the slugs and snails because they haven't bothered to look under the pot. You usually see slugs and snail problems in greenhouses that they're overwatered, and they have lots of debris under the benches uh, and lots of hiding places. So here's a pretty good outbreak. Um, people call me on the phone and says, the mice have been eating my plants. No, the snails have been eating your plants. The slugs have been eating your plants. Um, measure all baits, uh, metaldehyde baits. These are products we can put out that are baits and the, and the slugs and snails come to them. However, measure all baits. Um, for some reason, dogs like it. And it's pretty much lethal to a dog. Of course, 
They're less effect pesticides are less effective at cooler temperatures because they're met metabolic poisons. If the insect or mite isn't metabolizing, it's not going to work, so they need to be appropriate temperatures. However, things like oils and soaps that are suffocants and stuff like that, they work better at cooler temperatures. Uh, when's the best time to spray? Typically when it's 65 to 85, most people spray after the workers go home. Not typically the best time to spray, but it's the best time to spray for the management. But you want to allow at least four hours before you, s you apply your overhead irrigation. Um, and think about things like this. The question is, do we spray or not spray? The old philosophy is don't worry, just spray. That was a prophylactic concept. That doesn't work anymore because the pesticides don't work that way. Scouting and monitoring are required. And using your degree days to calculate how fast your insect populations are going to be moving through your crop.